Well, we're continuing our series today on I Trust in the Lord God Almighty. Today we're going to look at how Jesus can solve our unsolvables. I have to admit, I am lost with all of this new technology. I'm like Max Licato who said, I went to sleep one night in a world of sticky notes, and I woke up the next morning in a paperless society. I like to hold real books, and I like to have real files. One day I was in a panic because I wanted to find an important file that I knew that Lonnie had put in the file cabinet, and I looked all over for it, and I couldn't find it, and I was in a panic. And so I asked Mark and Brandon, where is this file? It's really important, and we have this, and and I can't find it. And they replied that it's in the computer. And my response is, what if the computer breaks? And then we'll lose it. And they said, no, it's in the cloud. And I said, where's the cloud? And then I said, Lonnie, come back. (laughs) I'm like the guy whose computer literacy is so severe, he thought a cursor was a person who used foul language. (laughs) A modem was something you flushed, and a mouse was a rodent that you trapped. You can say that I'm pretty much overwhelmed with all of this new technology. I can't even figure out the stuff on our cars. We have automatic seat warmers. Our other car, you had to push a button and and have the heat come on. And I was, it was a cold day, and I was sitting, and I thought my car was on fire because my seat was hot. And then I didn't even try to do it on purpose. I was looking at the buttons on my steering wheel, and I guess I pushed. I didn't even realize I had it. It warms the steering wheel, and I thought all of the electrical circuits in my my whole car had just went out because it was on fire. And not only that, we have a car that automatically brakes for you. And we have this car that you put it on cruise control, and you push this button, and it steers for you. I'm not kidding. But it also has this little eye, and I don't like that little eye because it watches you. Because if I look over this way, it starts flashing, keep your eyes on the road, keep your eyes on the road. (laughs) If If I move around a little bit in the car, it says, pay attention, pay attention. And I don't like this car because when I get in the car, it says, hi, Doug. (laughs) And when I leave it, it has this message, bye, Doug. And I think this car is smarter than I am. So I don't like all of this stuff. This past year was a year of constantly being overwhelmed for everyone. You know the word. You know the feeling. You know what that paralyzed deer in the headlights fear that that surfaces when the information is just too much to learn, the changes are too great for us to make, the decisions are just too much to manage, and the grief is too deep to, to surface, and the mountain is just too tall to climb, or the crowd is too numerous to feed. This fourth sign in the Gospel of John is found in all four of the Gospels. If it's found in all four of the Gospels, I think it's very important, amen? It is Jesus feeding the 5,000 plus. How do you feed probably around 15,000 people when you're in the middle of nowhere? It's an impossible situation. And by the way, the population of Galilee, they believe at the time, was around 40,000 people. So half of the people had come out to see Jesus and the signs that he was doing in the healing of the sick. This is an overwhelming and seemingly unsolvable problem. Jesus is going to show the disciples that he can solve our unsolvables. So if you're here today or if you're listening and you have this great problem and it's just way beyond you, you came to the right service and you're listening to the right message because we're going to see how Jesus solves the unsolvable. If you have your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. I'll give you a moment to turn there. The Gospel of John, chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 1, it reads, After this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee. A huge crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he had performed by healing the sick. Jesus went up a mountain and sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. So when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, Where will we buy bread so that these people can eat? He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down. The men numbered about 5,000. When Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. 
so also with the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were full, he told his disciples, collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, this truly is the prophet who is to come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus realized that they were about to come and, and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountains by himself. This is a huge unsolvable problem for the disciples. How do you meet the needs of people in such a vast crowd of people? What do you do with all of these people? Our version of all these people could be simply all these diapers, or all this homework for the young people, or all these long days, or could be disrupting like all of this dialysis, or all this depression, or all of these bills. You see, sometimes we have things in our life that are just unsurmountable and unsolvable. Whatever it is, the demands outstrip the supply and you're left feeling as hopeless as Philip and as meager as Andrew. How do you meet the legitimate needs of this vast crowds around us today? We have four, four possible solutions that are proposed by solving this huge problem of feeding this large group of people. It reminds me of Ozark Food Harvest. They used to call me about every month several years ago, and every month it was the same thing. They would tell me how Dallas County is a poverty area and that they were wanting a station to, to, to supply food for the needy in our community. And, and every time they would talk, I would say, okay, tell me a little bit more about this. And they'd say, okay, well, we want you to distribute food. I said, okay, what do we need to do to do that? Well, you got to fund it. You mean it's going to cost money? Yeah, a lot of money. You need to staff it and you need to administer the food program. And I thought, ah, that's a lot of work. I don't think we want to do that. Plus, bring all the people, the most needy, and the people probably who, who are the most sickly into our church. I thought, ah, I'm not sure about this. So I kept saying no. And then I was convicted. How many of you have ever said no and changed your mind? You know, when you say no to God, God has a way of reminding us that you better rethink this. And so I was convicted. That's not a word we hear a lot. It just simply meant I, in my heart I felt bad because I knew that as a Christian this is what we should do. But it also was very overwhelming. They, they reassured me. They said, now you will peek out with 100 families. Yeah, we did that after like two months. But I was convicted. Calvary Chapel stepped out in faith, and we began distributing food several years ago to those living in poverty in Dallas County. And for the next several years, the burden of finances fell on Calvary Chapel. When we gave Jesus our five loaves and two fish, you know what Jesus did? He multiplied it. Now we give food to around 300 families, a little over that, every month. And that represents between 600 and 1,000 people every month. Once a month, 300 families enter this physical facilities to receive help. They receive not only food, but respect and kindness because they are our neighbors in need. We have a new group that's meeting our church beginning this month. It's called the First Steps. And the First Steps program is a support group for women who've been abused in, in horrible situations. You know, I want to tell you, if the church does not reach out to people in need, we should change our name to just a social club. Amen. We've got to meet people's needs in Jesus' name. Well, back to the four possible solutions that they had. You know, these disciples, Jesus, it, it clearly says that Jesus knew what he was going to do, but he wanted to test the disciples to see how much faith they had. You know, sometimes God tests all of us. Sometimes we're in situations where we don't have the answers, and it's humbling to know that we're not in control, and God says, you're right where I need you to be, where I can use you. Well, one of the first possible solutions is found in Mark and Matthew. The disciples suggested to Jesus that you just send the people away. Just, yeah, I know they're hungry, Jesus, but just get rid of the problem. But Jesus knew that the hungry people would faint on their way if somebody didn't feed them. All over America and all over the world, churches turn a blind eye to the needs around them. There are too many churches that, are dis that if they disappeared tomorrow, no one in the community would care or miss them because they've done nothing to minister in Jesus' name to the needs of the community. It's easy to think that if you give more, you'll have less, but that's not how it works in God's economy. If you remember right after we moved into our new sanctuary, the famous ice storm came. How, where's Curtis at? Curtis, Curtis, how old are you? Uh, 14. 14 years ago. <laughs> I know that. 
Your mom knows that too. Because <laughs> Curtis came into the world during an ice storm. <laughs> but 14 years ago, our community, nobody had electricity. Nobody had heat. And so we, we opened our church facility up to, to people who, who needed that. And we opened it up to first responders and to people who were coming to help our community. And it was quite a step of faith because we didn't know how we were going to pay for it. And, and, you know, we put things on our credit card and we ran it up. And, 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 and you know, we, I'll have to admit, I was kind of thinking, God, are you sure we should do this? And God said, who else should do it? You realize that who else should do it but God's people? And we did it, and God blessed. And, and out of that and out of some other things in our community, a disaster team was founded. And, you know, I'm, one of the hardest things for me uh, as I've gotten older is that I've always never tried to ask anyone to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. And now we ask men and women of our church to go and cut trees and to pick up limbs and to help people in need. And I can't do those things anymore, but I can pray for you. But I praise God for the people of our church that respond to the needs of others, and they're not doing it for any other reason other than they love the Lord. How many of you know that a tornado is devastating? The first house that Betsy... By the way, tomorrow Betsy and I will celebrate our 40th anniversary. It's, it's, and, I wish that we were younger so we could have more years together. I love Betsy. I just love being with her. But we'll be together within eternity. I know that. But we're going to go by ourselves because Anna's in Oklahoma with Cynthia and the dogs with De John and Debbie. And so it's just Betsy and I. And so I hope we can get along. You know, I just, I think we will. But anyway, that, that doesn't have anything to do with the sermon. But you've got to step out in faith. And there's sometimes when you're in situations where you don't have answers, but you know that God says do it, and you need to do it. I am sure that all the medical professionals have been overwhelmed this past year. I'm really thankful for uh, the people of our community. I'm thankful for the, 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 the uh, I'm, I'm trying to get this right, because uh, the CMH, right? clinic because the Lord saved my life but the Lord used them to help me save my life I won't say any more but other than thank you because they went above and beyond when nobody knew anything about this virus and, and, and if God doesn't have a sense of humor to make me the person that was the first person in the community to get it and so but I got it and everybody was scared and the nurses came in and they were kind and they were nice and I appreciate that and you know there are situations that all of us have, and God puts us in these situations. It's way beyond us, but it's not beyond God. But the one thing we never want to do is do like Mark and Matthew, just suggesting let's just ignore it. Let's just pretend like it's not here. The second solution came from Philip. Philip counted the cost and decided that they would need the equivalent of 200 days wages. Too often we think that money is the answer to <clears throat> every need. And of course, Jesus was simply testing the strength of Philip's faith. There's a guy by the name of George Mueller. You may not have ever heard of him. If, you're, if you've studied anything about prayer, George Mueller's name will come up. Few people have witnessed more miracles than George Mueller. Along with pastoring one church for 60 years, Mueller established the Ashley Down Orphanage in Bristol, England. He cared for over 10,000 orphans. He established 117 schools for these orphans' educations throughout England. Adjusting for inflation, George Mueller raised about $150 million for those kingdom causes. That's an incredible sum of money by any standards, but what it makes it even more remarkable is the fact that George Mueller never asked anyone for anything, not a single penny. Now I want you to, I want you to hear this. He raised over 150 millions and never went to churches begging for money. He never went to individuals asking for money. This is what happened. Mueller made a covenant with God that he would ask only God for the needs of the orphans. He had a reason behind it. Mueller figured that God knew exactly what he needed and when he needed it, and God would make provisions when he needed it. It's estimated that Mueller experienced 30,000 specific answers to prayer because he kept a prayer journal with a prayer request and how God answered it. Isn't that marvelous? One man. Time and time again, food was dropped off at the doorsteps right when they ran out of food. A donation was made right before a bill became due. 
Or a plumber would offer his service right when a problem needed to be fixed. Our God is a big God. Amen. And sometimes we so much limit him. As we've been praying this past hundred days, and I don't want that to stop. It's, we're going to have a culminating event, but I want us to continue that. But for two of the four pillars is we're praying for uh, workers, and we're also praying for direction in our life, and our church, and our community, and for our leaders. What to tell you, God in his work needs every one of us. Amen? And we need him. But I want to tell you this. If we can figure everything out, then it's not going to be very miraculous. But we serve a God that puts desires in our hearts. He puts a vision in our heart, and it's bigger than we are. And God says, just watch what I do. Just watch what I do. Everyone wants a miracle, but no one wants to be in a situation that necessitates one. Let me say that again because I want you to really really sink in. Everyone wants a miracle. How many of you want a miracle? We all do. But... No one wants to be in a situation that necessitates it because a miracle is when it's something way beyond us and we can't do it and there's no way possible for us to do it and we need God's intervention. When we're in these positions, it's difficult. But you can't have one of them without the other. So God gracefully puts us in situations where enough isn't enough. We find ourselves in situations where we need to feed 20,000 people and we only have two fish to our names. When God gives a vision, he makes a provision. You know, 32 years ago when we first came here, there was a small group of people and the church was very small. And when we look at what all God's done, we look at it and say, nobody can take credit for this. This is something of the Lord. And I praise God that I was just a part of it. You see, God gives us a vision in our lives. God does something in your life. Mueller, George Mueller, was just one man. One man that God put a desire in his heart to help the orphans and to do something about it. And he stepped out in faith, and God used him to establish over 100 schools, ministering to over 10,000 orphans. One man, used by God, totally committed, no telling what we could do when we do that. When God gives a vision, he makes a provision. Whatever God has asked you to do, and you may be saying, no, that's too big for me. And God says, yes, I know, but I want you to step out in faith. And I want you to realize that I am big enough. Ron, God answers prayers. Amen. And number three, the third solution came from Andrew. But it was not, he was not quite sure how the problem could be solved. He found a little boy who had a small lunch, two fish, and five barley cakes. We don't know how Andrew met this lad, but we're glad that he did. Somehow Andrew was out in the crowd. He was out among the people, and he found this little boy. Sometimes we forget that Jesus' ministry was on the streets. Too often we think ministry is all about this church building, and we forget that real ministry is out there. That's where the people are. That's where the lost people are. That's where the people are that are in need. Those are where the people are that we need to help meet those needs in Jesus' name. And you might say, well, this is bigger than us. Absolutely, it's bigger than us, but it's not too big for our God. World Vision 30-Hour Famine and Fast for Famine has been going on in our church for quite some time with our young people. Several years ago, one of our teens was coming to this event, and there was a homeless hitchhiker that was hitchhiking, and he picked him up, and of all things, you know what this kid did? He brought him to this activity, to this 30 hours of famine. God brought a homeless man to show us that hunger and homelessness is real. The good news about this is that this man was so touched by these young people and the adult sponsors loving him and caring about him that he was broken and he said, I'm going to go back home. And and some of the leaders of our church, they gave him odd and in jobs and he he raised enough money where he could get a bus ticket and he could go home back to his family. Now, homeless is a problem and it's always been a problem. Amen? I will tell you. It's good to feed, and we need to feed the homeless, and we need to provide shelter for them. But you know what they need above those things? They need someone to hear their story. They need someone to sit down with them and to hear what's going on and to pray with them and to encourage them because they don't have to stay in homelessness. And the fourth solution came from Jesus, and it was true a true solution. He took the little boy's lunch, he blessed it, he broke it, he handed it out to the disciples, and they fed the whole crowd. The miracle took place in the hands of the Savior, not in the hands of the disciples. And that's something for all of us to learn. When God calls us and gives us a vision and he tells us to go and reach others and to help people and meet them in Jesus' needs, it's way above us and we can't do it, but the Savior can. You see, 
the disciples were there with Jesus, but he was the one that broke it and blessed it and gave it out, and they were used to help give it out. He multiplied the food. They only had the joyful privilege of passing it out. And what a great blessing it is for all of us who know the Lord to be able to be used by God, to see God do these miraculous things, and for us to be the eyes and ears and hands and feet of Jesus. Not only were the people fed and satisfied, but the disciples savaged 12 baskets of fragments for future use. Jesus wanted nothing for this. He just did it because it was the right thing to do. And brothers and sisters, when we do things in Jesus' name and meet needs in Jesus' name, we're not doing it for any accolades. We're not doing it for anybody to say anything good about us. We just want to lift up the name of Christ. The impossible challenge of feeding all those people became the unforgettable miracle of all these people fed. What we cannot do, Christ does. The problems that you and I face are just opportunities for Christ to prove the point. If you see your troubles as nothing more than isolated hassles and hurts, you'll only become bitter and angry. But if you see your troubles as opportunities to trust God and his ability to multiply what you have given him, then even the smallest incident takes on significance. Do you face 15,000 problems? Before you count your money, bread or fish, and before you count yourself out, turn and look at the one standing next to you, the Lord Jesus Christ, and count first on Christ. He is the one that we go to first. He is the first resource. He can help you do the impossible. You simply need to give him what you have and watch him work. No gift is too small for Jesus to use and to multiply. Max Lucado said, if God can turn a basket into a buffet with food to spare, don't you think he can do something with five loaves and two fish of faith that we have? There's a lady by the name of Biddy Chambers. Probably many of you have never heard of her. Maybe you have. If she had given up, nobody would have criticized her. If she would have just walked away, no one would have thought any less of her. Her God-given assignment was to partner with her husband in teaching the Bible. She and her husband met in 1908, and in 1910 they married. They lived in London. They went busy about their dream of building a Bible college. They purchased a really large home and made the rooms available for students and for missionaries on furlough. Biddy's training was a stenographer. She was someone who recorded. Where's Brett at? You're a stenographer, aren't you? Can you come and record my message? No. He he said, absolutely. Oh, my goodness. That's wonderful. Because, you know, Leanne will will love you because she won't have to decipher my, my stuff. Okay. Well, that's off the sermon. But she was a stenographer. In other words, she was able to write and take notes. And that was her job. Now, I want you to remember that that was her job. She took careful notes of her husband's lectures and turned them into correspondent courses so that other people can benefit them. On the outbreak of World War I, her husband felt a call to minister to soldiers stationed in Egypt. He and Biddy and their two-and-a-half-year-old daughter moved to the Middle East where he took a position as a chaplain for the army. Their ministry continued. He taught and she translated. He lectured and she captured the messages. It was a perfect partnership. It was, it was a wonderful thing. And people, when they saw these two people, they just thought, what a wonderful blessing, these two together. Then came the setback. The setback that any of us would not be critical of her if she just went back home and just quit and just sat down and, and died. You see, her husband had complications from appendicitis. It rendered Biddy a widow. Her husband died at the age of 43. She buried him in Egypt, returned to London to face this question, how could her partner, her husband, how could she continue this partnership? How could she continue to do what God had called them to do? All dreams of teaching ministry would need to be abandoned, right? Well, no. Biddy chose to give God her loaves and her fish. She set about the work of turning her husband's notes into pamphlets and mailing them to friends and to acquaintances. Eventually, they were compiled into a book, My Utmost for His Highest, that was published in 1927. I have a copy of that book here. Many of you may have perhaps have read it. I've got the, the large print edition for us older people. But let me tell you a little bit about this book. No one could have predicted the impact that this volume would have upon its readers. The people who love this devotional book and made it their main devotional book are people by the name of Billy Graham. Anybody ever heard of him? Bill Bright. 
Henrietta Mears. Bill Wilson and Bob Smith, the founders of Alcoholic Anonymous, when they would meet, they would always begin with a devotion from Oswald Chambers, my utmost for his highest. George W. Bush turned to this devotional book for inspiration. It has sold more than 13 million copies. It's been translated into more than 35 languages. You see, the work of Oswald Chambers surely exceeded his fondest hope. But it was the sincere faith of his wife, Biddy, that made all the difference. When most people would have given up and just went home, she continued to do what God had called them together and finished this wonderful work. She gave what she had to Jesus, and with it, Jesus fed and feeds the multitudes. We need to follow her example. The next time you feel overwhelmed, remind yourself of the one who stands next to you. It's not the person there. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. You are not alone. You are not without help. What bewilders you does not bewilder him. You're uphill or downhill. He's with you all the way. He is not stumped by your problems. When you present your needs to him, he never ever turns to the angels and says, well, it's finally happened. Somebody has such a great need, it stumped me, I can't meet it. Aren't you glad that our God can meet all needs? Not some needs, all needs. Do you know what that means for you and I? No matter what your problems are, no matter how unsurmountable they are, they're not unsurmountable to the Lord. You may feel outnumbered, but God does not. All we need to do is give God what we have, offer thanks, and just watch him go to work. Your list of blessings will be so long, you'll need to buy a hard drive for your computer so that you can store it. Or for those of us who don't like computers, about 100 file cabinets. You see, our God is a God of miracles. And whatever we're going through today, whatever it is, God is bigger than our problems. God is able to meet our needs. Jesus can solve our unsolvables if we just give him what we have. You might say, well, I don't have much. That's okay. Give him your two fish. Give him your five barley loaves. And look what he will do in your life and how he will use you to be a blessing to others. Let's stand together.